So here's the plan for today's lecture. We will be focusing on the chemistry of mineral formation because I know you all love chemistry. This is the reason why you care about chemistry. So we'll start off with just some real basics about the atom. It's going to be review for some of you, but some of you might have forgotten about it or maybe never learned about it. So just some basics about chemistry of the atom. And then we'll talk about what an ion is and what an ionic bond is. And then we'll talk about what geologists think are important minerals. And the punchline is those uh, minerals that have silica tetrahedron involved in them uh, we think are particularly important. So we will talk about the silica tetrahedron. Uh, for what it's worth, this will probably be the most technical lecture of the entire semester. So if you're like, oh my goodness, we're going to be doing this technical stuff all semester long. Uh, it's really just today and maybe a little bit into tomorrow. That's this week. Um, so yeah, enjoy. Okay, so talking a little bit about last class. Oh yeah, we always review. It's always there at the beginning, kind of mentally in my mind. So we talked last time about how mountains have roots. Uh, I know you can't really respond to me, but if there are still questions about what a mountain root is and how as the mountain gets taller, the root gets deeper. As you add weight to the continent and make it taller, it again balances out by getting deeper. If you remove the things from the top, it floats up. Uh, this is that whole concept of isostasy. And I realize I never gave you a super fancy definition of isostasy, so this is a Wikipedia <laughs> definition. Sometimes Wikipedia can be wrong, but it's actually not so bad, at, uh, at least not, not anymore. Or at, least at this point, it's not pretty good. Um, so it is a noun, and it says it's isostasy or isostatic equilibrium is the state of gravitational equilibrium between Earth's crust and mantle, such that the crust floats at an elevation that depends on its thickness and density. So it's basically what we said it was. So it's, it's this thing, this quality that things have, um, this the continents have, and it's what causes them to be um, at the elevations they are and to stick up as much as they do and to extend down as deep as they do. So feel free to write it down if you want to, as long as you could answer questions like what would happen if you added weight or removed weight or, or how the route would change depending on how tall the mountain was, you should be just fine. Okay, then we also talked about the differences between rocks and minerals. And so for each one of these, you should be able to tell me why they are not minerals. So let's start off with this one. If I were to ask you, what's the main reason that one is not a mineral? What are you hopefully thinking in your mind? Well, hopefully you're thinking there are light areas, there are dark areas, black, white, pink. Even if you can't see the colors, you can see that it's speckled, which means it does not have a single chemical composition throughout. So again, minerals have to have a single chemical composition throughout. That one obviously doesn't, so that can't be a mineral. What about this one right here? Liquid, right? Minerals have to be solid. And what about glass? What was the main reason that glass is not a mineral? The main reason is the atoms are not arranged in an organized fashion. If you were thinking man-made, okay, it's true, yes, it has to be naturally occurring. Remember, though, there is naturally occurring volcanic glass. So the better answer as to why glass is not a mineral is that it cooled so quickly to become glass, the atoms never had time to arrange themselves in, in that repeating crystal form pattern that we talked about. And we were looking at how um, comparing graphite and diamond, they have the same composition at both carbon, but it's the crystal forms, the way those carbon atoms are arranged that make those two minerals very different from one another. So it's really important the atoms be arranged in an organized fashion. If not, um, it's not a mineral. And then depending on how it is arranged, there's different kinds of minerals that it might be. And then reminder that the physical properties that a mineral has is due to the, the mineral's chemistry. So again, depending on what ingredients there are, depending on how they're arranged, they have these different physical properties. And that's what the focus of um, lab was last week. The focus of lab this week will be using these properties to identify specific minerals. But for lecture, the first thing we're talking about here um, is the chemistry behind the formation of minerals. 
So talking a little chemistry here. So first thing just to know is that minerals are made out of atoms. In fact, atoms are the building block of everything that exists. The dry erase board, my beautiful t-shirt, which I'll show you what it says a little bit later on if you can't read it. Uh, but yeah, you should know that minerals are made out of atoms. Minerals are made out of atoms. So I suppose I could have showed you me drawing that on the board, although it's not that surprising. So minerals are made out of atoms. And you could say atoms are the basic building blocks of all things. So again, atoms are the basic building blocks of all things including minerals. So the question then is, okay, what exactly is an atom and what is contained in an atom? So first off, actually before I answer that, I have the slide I just did wanted to, to mention really quickly. Um, just pointing out kind of like what my perspective on all of this is. So we do offer an associate's degree for students looking to transfer to a four-year. We call those ASTs. And you'll note that to be a geology major and to get this AST, um, there's a one-year chemistry required. Now, there is actually a second associate's degree. It's sort of your normal associate's degree. I'm calling here a regular associate's degree. Um, this other version of our associate's degree actually only offers or only requires one semester of chemistry, so just Chem 1A, as well as one semester of math, just Math 1A. And the reason for this is that if you want to transfer to Sac State, Sac State doesn't require a year of chemistry, it doesn't require a year of math, it just requires one semester of each. So if you were a little turned off with the whole idea of becoming a geology major because you're not really into chemistry or into math, um, if you do go to Sac State, there is a lesser chemistry and math requirement. Uh, most other colleges do require more chemistry and more math. And honestly, it really depends on what subfield in geology most interests you. If you do what I did, which was geophysics, um, taking the math was, was important, um, taking a bunch of kind of fancy physics was important. If you want to do like mineralogy type stuff, if you want to look at the, the chemistry of rocks and minerals, then you need to take chemistry. So yeah, depending on what you really want to end up doing, you might choose to take more. But um, anyways, the main point for the moment is that if you're a geology major, you're going to be required to take some more chemistry. And the reason I bring this up now is that I'm not going to bother getting into certain details because you're going to just get those details if, if you take a chemistry class. So either you're not going to be a geology major, in which case maybe you don't care about the details, or you are going to be a geology major and you're going to take chemistry at some point anyways. So this will be a very cartoon version of chemistry here. Okay, let me put my face back in there because it's such a beautiful face. Okay, so ways of visualizing an atom. So depending on your background, you might see atoms in different ways. Uh, on the homework sheet I gave you um, the, for today, uh, there is this picture. So if you wanted to pause the video and kind of open the homework sheet up so that you can look at that picture, you can. Um, but whatever, there's just different models for an atom. And what unifies all of these different models is they all contain a nucleus central area that contains protons and electrons, I'm sorry, protons and neutrons, and then whizzing around the nucleus in a variety of different ways, we have electrons. The specifics of why one textbook uses one drawing and a different textbook uses a different drawing isn't really our thing, but just kind of very briefly, um, if you are interested in understanding why some atoms are larger than other atoms, uh, visualizing the electrons around the nucleus as being a cloud is a really nice way of visualizing um, the size that different atoms have. Uh, the one I gave you guys, and this one down here, has these little orbital shells. Uh, if you take chemistry, you, you learn that there's certain rules governing how many electrons are in each orbital shell, and that um, they like having full shells. And a lot of the chemical reactions are based on an understanding of these, these little orbitals that they have. So, so if you did take some chemistry, you've probably learned about orbitals. Um, you do learn they are a bit more three-dimensional. 
So that's what this other picture over here is all about. Um, and also, like, as electrons bounce from one shell to another, that's what gives things their color. Um, you might see this more kind of like a nuclear drawing of the atom. Whatever. I don't really care which picture you have in your mind. Here is the cartoon version I'm going to put on the board. So all atoms contain a central area called the nucleus. And inside the nucleus, we have protons and neutrons. So inside the nucleus are these really, really tiny little bits, these protons and neutrons. Protons, if you're pro something, you're, you're for it, you're, you're positive about it. So protons have a positive electrical charge, so I'm going to give it a plus sign. Again, in case you couldn't hear me because my back was turned, I, I wrote it, or I'm saying it has a positive electrical charge. Neutrons are neutrally charged. They have no electrical charge. And I usually just put a little zero for the neutrons. And I'm just putting them in parentheses just as an indicator of them. So neutrally charged, or you could say has no electrical charge. neutrally charged or has no electrical charge. So just looking at these pictures here, in all three of these pictures, I have six blue circles. They have plus signs next or within them, so it has six protons. And then it has three red circles. Those are the neutrons. So I'm just going to draw one of, actually any one of them on the board. They all look the same from the nucleus perspective. Rather than make it random, I'm just making it fast and easy by just putting six kind of in a row. Makes it easier to count them anyways. And they all had three neutrons. So if you wanted, if you didn't have your homework sheet or if you don't have a printer, you could just draw three versions of this in your notes right now. You could pause the video because there will be three different versions of those nuclei. Okay, so six protons and three neutrons. Now, again, whizzing around the nucleus, whether it's in a shell or an orbital or a cloud or whatever, there's also P and there's these fancy orbitals that exist too. It doesn't matter for this class. But surrounding the nucleus are negatively charged bits called electrons. So surrounding the nucleus are negatively charged. electrons. Again, surrounding the nucleus are negatively charged electrons. And I could just give it a dash sign. Um, sometimes when I erase the board, little, little dashes get left behind, or just I use dashes. And so just to make it extra clear, I give it a little E with a dash. So that is the symbol that I use for electrons. Again, feel free to pause. So in these various drawings, or at least the ones I provided you, this one here contains six electrons. This contains two electrons. This contains, looks like, eight electrons. So draw some number of <laughs> electrons whizzing around the drawings. Or you can draw the three versions. Uh, maybe I'll just draw, I'll make my own. I'll give that one three. Oh, actually, let's give it four. So I'm, I'm just making up how many electrons it has. For those of you with some chemistry background, you might recognize which particular element I've drawn. And you might be like, wait a minute, the number of electrons you're drawing isn't quite right. Well, I'm just making it up. So work with me. OK, so that's the basics of an atom. Atoms, again, have a nucleus that contains protons and neutrons. Protons have a positive charge. Neutrons are neutrally charged. 
And then around that, whizzing around, like planets orbiting around a star, are the electrons. And they have a negative electrical charge. So one thing that I would like you to be able to do, if I were to draw any element on the board or on an exam, or if you look at the example I have up there on the screen, I could ask you, okay, which element are you looking at? So if you look at those three drawings right there, I guess the first question is, are those all the same element? Are they different elements? Or if you look at the one I drew on the board, six protons, three neutrons, four electrons. One of those numbers was important for knowing what element you're looking at. Is it the number of protons, the number of neutrons, or the number of electrons? Do you guys know? Well, if I tell you that all three of these are exactly the same element, what's true about all three of those? Actually, there's two things that are true. Maybe that wasn't the best example. Let me just give you the answer since I can't interact with you guys anyways. So the key thing is the number of protons. So if you look at the periodic table of elements, you have hydrogen here. It's number one on the periodic table. That's telling you it has one proton. Helium is number two. That's telling you it has two protons. Lithium is three. It contains three protons. Beryllium, four. Four protons. Boron, five. And it just keeps going. And no, you don't have to have any of those memorized. All that you really need to know related to this, the key thing in a drawing like this, is the number of protons. The number of protons tells you which element you're looking at. Where can I put it? Let's put it down here. So a key thing when you look at an atom, the number of protons. For those of you that know chemistry. They call this the atomic number. I'm not going to ask you to memorize that because, I don't know, it's just a word. For me, as long as you know it's the number of protons, that's actually what the whole point of it is. So, uh, again, the key is the number of protons tells you which elements you have. So the number of protons tells you which elements you have. This particular example here on the board contains six protons. So it is the sixth element on the periodic table. And I'm going to pull up the periodic table in just a second. You'll see that it is carbon. So what is drawn on the board, what I put on this sheet here, are three different versions of carbon. Oh, <laughs> I'll show you that in a second. Um, so again, true or false, these are all the same elements. Same number of protons, yes, and, and it is carbon. Okay, fine, I'll go back to my this. So I don't know if you guys can, um, can see my t-shirt. Oh, in case you can't see my t-shirt, I just have a picture of my t-shirt here. Um, so yeah, remember to enjoy the little things in life, like protons. So that's the shirt I'm wearing. It's my, my ode to protons t-shirt. And again, the reason we care about protons is that the number of protons tells you what? Wrong direction. Tells you which element you're looking at. Number of protons. Very important thing. Okay, so again, we are looking at carbon because it is the sixth element on the periodic table there. And um, yeah. Okay, so what's different about A, B, and C is their electrical behavior. So if you look at option A here, it has six protons and it has six electrons. The positive charge of a proton and the negative charge of an electron will cancel each other out. So if you have one plus charge and one minus charge, you get something neutral to cancel each other out. If you look at B here, B contains more protons than electrons. So it has an overall positive electrical charge. If you look at option C, it contains more electrons than protons. So it has more ne negative charges than positive charges. It has an overall negative electrical charge. 
So these are different atoms. They have different electrical charges. This is important because it's the electrical charges that, de that determine whether an atom wants to bond. We'll get there. Okay, let's just talk about what I added there on the screen. So some of these are ions. So if we look at A, B, and C, again, A has an equal amount of protons and electrons. B has an overall positive charge. C has an overall negative charge. Some of those are ions, and some of them aren't. So let's talk about what an ion is, and then you can tell me which is an ion and which is not an ion. Okay, I am going to get rid of this because I need to get rid of something. Okay, so an ion, and you don't need to wait for me to write it, you can get started right now. An ion is an atom with an electrical charge. So again, an ion is an atom with an electrical charge. And what gets some people about this is that all atoms are made out of electrical bits, the protons and the electrons. But they don't all have an overall electrical charge. So I'm just going to draw, actually. Let's do A first, since I've covered it up. It has six protons, three neutrons. Neutrons are neutrally charged. It doesn't matter. I could give it however many neutrons I felt like giving it. Uh, we will get back to the importance of the number of neutrons when we talk about isotopes, when we talk about radioactivity of things, but not, not for right now. So the first one, that's my cartoon version of it. It had six protons three neutrons, and six electrons. I just put the electrons in rows so they're easy to count. Does this atom have an electrical charge overall? No. It has six positives, six negatives. They balance each other out. They cancel each other out. So this one is neutrally charged. It has no electrical charge. It is not an ion. So it has no electrical charge that says, sorry the red's a little faint, um, it is not an ion. So it has no electrical charge, it is not an ion. So that was option A. Option B had six protons, three neutrons, and two electrons. Is that an ion? Does it have an electrical charge? Yes. So electrical charges can be positive or negative. So this has more plus charges than minus charges. This has an overall positive electrical charge. It is an ion. Let me see if the green shows up better. Nope. <laughs> Just use black or blue. Has an overall. Positive. electrical charge. So again, it has an overall positive electrical charge. An ion is an atom with an electrical charge. This has one. It's a positive one. This is an ion. The second one that was B on the picture was an ion. The last one on the picture, I'll just use my first drawing of it, it had six protons three neutrons, and I think it had eight electrons. So, just 
count your electrons, 80 electrons. So six protons, 80 electrons. Does this have an electrical charge? Yeah. So we have more electrons than protons. So this has an overall negative electrical charge. That has a negative electrical charge. Again, an ion is an atom with an electrical charge. This has one. It's a negative one. It's an ion. So, two of the examples were ions. The first one wasn't. The first one had an equal number of protons and electrons. It balanced itself out. The neutrally charged one is stable. It's happy. The one that's a little bit too negative the one that's a little bit too positive, those are the unstable ones. Those are the ones that want to become neutral. And the way they become neutral is by linking up with other oppositely charged ions, forming these bonds called ionic bonds. So ions forming ionic bonds are the building blocks of minerals. So again, how do you know which element you're looking at? It is the number of Protons, right? Always looking at the number of protons to know what element you have. Again, these all have six protons, so they're all the element carbon. Again, what's different is their electrical behavior. Some are ions. Two are false. All three are ions. False, which is not the ion. The first one, why? Because it has equal numbers of protons and electrons. Uh, option B there has more protons than electrons. It has an overall positive charge. It is an ion. Option C has more negatives than positives. It is also an ion. Now, what kind of an ion you are matters. So again, when we were looking at example B, which is this one over here, six protons, two electrons. Sorry, my whole camera got a little bit off here. Um, it has an overall positive charge. This one over here has an overall negative charge. Well, if you take a positive one and you bring it next to another positive one, they don't really like that. It's kind of like having a magnet with the northern sides of the magnets. You put north against north and they're repelling each other. Or if you take the south against the south and they repel each other. But if you take the north and you take the south and you put them next to each other, they're going to stick together. So oppositely charged ions will attract one another. That attraction creates a linkage between the two, a bond, specifically called an ionic bond. So something about oppositely charged ions. are attracted to each other. Oppositely charged ions are attracted to each other. They link together. Forming a bond. And specifically, we call it an ionic bond. So an ionic bond is a bond between oppositely charged ions. And that's what causes minerals to link together. So we need to make sure we have oppositely charged ions. And wouldn't it be convenient if there's a vocabulary word that we could use to communicate whether one ion has a positive charge or a negative charge? So maybe you've heard the word cation, or maybe you've heard the word anion. Those are types of ions. Specifically, a cation is a positively charged ion, like this first one we had over here. Actually, I guess it was B on the list. And an anion is an overall negatively charged ion. Okay, we should write that down in our notes. Again, the red is still not fantastic here. I'm going to maybe erase the middle one. It's neutrally charged because I need the board space and it's not an ion, so it's not really a part of this conversation.
So this one over here, more protons than electrons, that is a cat ion. Cat ion is a positively charged ion. A cat ion is a positively charged ion. That was B on, on the picture if you have that in your homework sheet. A negatively charged ion, this one over here, is an anion. So it's an ion, but more specifically, it's an an ion, which I know is kind of awkward to say that, it is a negatively charged ion. So cation and an ion. And yes, you should know those words, cation and anion. So you need some way to just remember which is which. And on one hand, it's just kind of sheer memorization. On the other hand, here's the strategy that I used when I was a student. You might hate it, but this is what I did. So I like cats. Cats are positive things in my life. I know, it's kind of cheesy. Uh, but if you notice, cat ion has, has cat in it. So if you think, okay, cats are positive things, then cat ions are the positively charged ions. Now, if you hate cats, that doesn't work so well. So another strategy, especially if you're not a cat person, is to notice that the word cat ion has a letter T in it, which looks a lot like a plus sign. So cat ion has a little plus sign in its name. It's a T, but it looks like a plus sign. Notice the anion doesn't have a T. There's no plus sign. And if you think about, like, if you have an, like an anarchist, or an anti-this, or anti-that, I hate everything, I'm a negative person. So, you see an, you start thinking negative. It's a negatively charged ion. You see a plus sign, or if you like cats, then that is a positively charged ion. So, ions are atoms with electrical charges. When they have positive, sorry, when they have positive electrical charges, we call them cations. When they have negative electrical charges, we call them anions. And, I keep doing this, oppositely charged ions, cations and anions, are electrically attracted to one another. They'll link together, forming bonds. This kind of a bond is called an ionic bond. And again, it's the most common way that minerals form. Let's do a few examples here. Oh. Yeah, if you want to know how many electrons are in each orbital, take chemistry. Again, you take chemistry if you're a geology major. So what you would do on an exam, or what I would do on an exam, I would just provide you with information. It might seem magical. There's reasons I've picked what I've picked for these examples, that they're based on chemistry and, and orbitals, but not super important in this class. So let me just point out to you that this picture up here, this is the element sodium. Sodium is abbreviated Na, here it is on the periodic table. It is the 11th element. And let's see, if I just tell you that sodium tends to give away that electron in its outer shell, so this is how many electrons, it, it, kind, of, it kind of wants it on one hand to have this many electrons, but it also wants its outermost orbital to be filled. And this orbital right here happens to be able to hold eight electrons. It's only holding one. It doesn't really like that. It's like, you know what, I don't, I don't need this electron. I'm going to give it away. So if sodium gives away that outermost electron, if we count the electrons it has left, there are two electrons in the inner orbital. There are, that's eight, eight electrons in the next orbital out. Two plus eight is ten. So basically, if I say sodium has ten electrons, would that make it an ion? How many protons does sodium have? 11, it's the 11th element. So if sodium has 11 protons and 10 electrons, what's its overall electrical charge? It's overall positively charged. So if we want to write a little example here. Make myself a little blob there. So, sodium, an 
abbreviated, oh, sorry, I don't want to, I, I got ahead of myself, so abbreviated NA. It is the 11th element. It has 10 electrons. That makes its orbitals very happy to have 10 electrons. So 11th element means 11 protons. 10 electrons. Its overall electrical charge is just a little positive. It has one more proton than the electron, which is why I put a plus sign there. I'm just so used to writing it that way. So we often express um, that form of ion, the ionic form of sodium, as Na with a plus sign. It has a slightly positive electrical charge. So it's happy in one way. Its orbitals are filled. It's not super happy the other way. It's not electrically balanced. So there's a sort of conflict that we're having here. You'll see a little bit more about that in a second. Okay, let's turn to the other side of the periodic table. So the other side of the periodic table, we're actually looking right over here, although I'll zoom in on it in a second. We are looking at chlorine. There's a vial of chlorine gas. And so chlorine is the 17th element on the periodic table, which means it has 17 what? 17 protons. To be electrically neutral, it would have 17 electrons, but the problem is it's not, the orbital shell is not, not happy that way. So let's, let's kind of look at this. So, so there's chlorine, it's, it's 17th element. So here we have two electrons in the inner shell, eight electrons there in the next shell. That is uh, 10, two plus eight. If it has another seven electrons out here, it's really, really close to having that outermost orbital filled. And it's like, I want to have that outermost orbital filled. So it tends to pick up these electrons that maybe other things are giving away. So like if sodium's like, hey, just, you know, I don't need that electron. Chlorine's like, I'll take it to fill up that electron shell. Again, if this whole electron shell thing is confusing you, just ignore it. I'm just bringing this up for those people that have the chemistry background, that want that refresher from their chemistry class. Here is how I would present it on a quiz or an exam. I would say, hey, there's chlorine. Look at the periodic table. It's 17 on the periodic table. That's abbreviated CL for chlorine. It's the 17th element, which again means it has 17 protons. And to have its orbitals full and happy, it has 18 electrons. So it just tends to have 18 electrons. So if I just gave you the information, it's the 17th element. It has 18 electrons. And I said, okay, is it an ion? What would you hopefully tell me? You'd hopefully be like, well, yeah. It has one more electron than proton. It is overall negatively charged. And I'd put a little, a little negative sign next to that, that L of, of chlorine. So sodium is a positively charged ion. What do we call the positively charged ions again? Cat ions. Chlorine likes to form a negatively charged ion. What do we call negatively charged ions? There it is, an, an anion. So, you now you hear people talk about opposites attract. That's how ionic bonds work. So this isn't quite stable and happy. It's, it's a little too positive. This one here, not happy, just a little bit too negative. You know those couples where you have like that, I'm happy all the time person, and you're like, you're just too happy all the time. That just, that's, you need somebody to balance you out. Or you have that negative person that's complaining about things all the time and you need like, you know what? The worst thing doesn't happen all the time. You need a more positive influence in your life. And you get these couples where one is like that really happy-go-lucky person and one's the kind of cranky negative person and you put them together and it works. They just kind of balance each other out. And again, that's how it's working in the mineral creation world. This has one too much plus, that has one too much minus. If you put the two together, you get NaCl, NaCl, which is electrically neutral. They're balancing each other out. So 
So the result, an ionic bond forms between the Na that's a little too positive and the Cl that's a little too negative and I mean I guess result again is NaCl which is electrically neutral. So they're balancing each other out. Minerals always form in such a way as to become electrically neutral. You don't want a little too much of a positive thing. You don't want a little too much of a negative thing. We need to become balanced. And whatever you need to link up with in order to create that electrical balance, that's what things do. And when they do that and form something neutral, that thing that it's creating is a mineral. So NaCl is a mineral, and you might even want to just for super clarification say minerals are electrically neutral. Or you could even say through the formation of ionic bonds, minerals form, they are electrically neutral. Minerals are electrically neutral. And when you see chemical formulas that are more complicated like CO2, carbon dioxide. You got your C and you got your oxygen. Well, in order to make it balanced, you might need two oxygens to balance out the, the electrical charge of the carbon. And the details of this aren't super important, but the carbon tends to have plus four charge. Oxygen tends to have a negative two charge. You need two negative twos to balance out the plus four. So you have these different ratios of one element versus another element in order to, to get that balance between the two. The main point for you guys is that you want it to become electrically neutral. Do whatever math has to get done so they're electrically neutral. And no, I'm not going to make you do the math. I was reading on the surveys. You guys, well, there's some people here that really like math. There's a number of you that don't like math. Math is an excellent tool. I'm a conceptual girl. As long as you understand this idea that we're balancing in ratios so that it becomes neutral. So if you have a, a plus two and a minus one, you need two minus ones to balance out the plus two. Once that happens, you have an electrically neutral thing. That's what a mineral is. Rewind if you need to. Okay, so again, opposites attract, so you can think about it like a magnet. In this particular example, the sodium was the positively charged thing. The chlorine was the negatively charged thing. You bring them nearby one another, and that electrical attraction causes them to link together like two magnets will stick together. That creates something that's electrically neutral. Do you guys know what NaCl is? What the mineral is that's the result of all this? Salt. Uh, the fancy word for salt is halite, um, but salt is a mineral, and the reason it forms is, is from this process. And what's really kind of crazy about NaCl is that sodium by itself, that sodium ion, is very, very different from salt, right? It's this metallic thing. If you threw it in water, it would go boom. And I'll show you a little video, video of that. And the chlorine by itself is a gas. If you breathed in this chlorine gas, you would die. They use this as a chemical weapon in wars. You put the two things together, they become electrically balanced and far less chemically reactive. They turn into something that's not just stable, but something that your body needs to survive. Salt. So here's a YouTube video. That's a hunk of sodium. And what's going to happen is, yes, explosion, they're going to throw it into a lake. I don't really recommend doing this, but that's why we're watching them do it, not doing it ourselves. Let me just fast forward. It takes a little while for them to get to that point where they are then going to throw. Oh, there it is. No, it's not. Ready to go. They're about to throw it. There it goes. It's in the air. Landing in the water. Doesn't look like much. 
<laughs> Isn't that cool? So that was sodium, right? Sodium by itself, you put it in water, it has these chemically exothermic reactions. It creates all this heat, boom, big explosion. Again, I don't want to show you the example with chlorine gas because it would just kill whoever was in the video. Two things, but independently, very, very different than that electrically balanced, that electrically neutral compound of the positively charged sodium together with the negatively charged chlorine balancing each other out to form NaCl, to form salt, to form halite is, again, the technical name for that mineral. And yeah, I mean, most minerals form due to ionic bonds. So uh, there are different kinds of bonds that do exist. Um, so I know you can read what's there in black. Other types of bonds exist and can be used to hold the atoms of a mineral together. But ionic bonds are most common. And again, if you're going to study for, for real, um, like if you're going to be a geology major, you're going to take chemistry. You can learn about covalent bonds and metallic bonds. Um, but really the most common one, the most important one that anybody taking a geology class should really know about are the ionic bonds. See where they're being romantic, the opposites are attracting, and that electrical attraction is linking together, linking them together. So that is the basics of how minerals bond. Okay, now that we have this concept of how minerals bond, we're going to now turn to talking about, okay, what minerals are important. And there's really two different kinds of, of minerals, two categories, you might say. So there are minerals like, like diamonds and rubies, which are very um, maybe economically and sort of socially important. We're like, oh, I value that. Um, I will spend lots of money on that necklace because it is so pretty. And then there are the minerals in this rock, which really aren't super desired in terms of things like jewelry. They're pretty common minerals. Um, so the question would then be, okay, which would be more important to a geologist? If you are a geologist and your goal is to understand how the world works, do you care the most about the pretty, shiny, sparkly minerals? Or do you care about the, those common minerals that we find in our rocks? Yeah, we really care about the common minerals. So the economic ones, the reason why they're expensive, typically, other than they're pretty, um, is they're pretty rare. And with rarity tends to come value. So the thing about that, though, is that if you are studying a mineral which is rare, it's not super representative of what minerals are on Earth because, well, it's rare. Those minerals that are the most common things you would see, like, for example, looking at that cliff right there, you're a lot more likely to find things like quartz and this mineral potassium feldspar, and I don't know, you don't know the names of the minerals yet, uh, but there are certain minerals that you're most likely to find when you're just walking around on Earth. When you want to study the crust, study the mantles, study the core, there are certain key minerals that will tell you something about the Earth. And it's those common ones that form Earth's layers that are the important ones to geologists. Those that are shiny and pretty, we might enjoy wearing them as jewelry, um, but they're not particularly important to geologists. And um, part of the reason I say this is that if you do become a geologist, you don't actually tend to learn a tremendous amount about the precious um, gemstones. Uh, there are gemologists that become specialists in studying gems and understanding uh, what gems are our most valuable, what, what most people are, are willing to pay for. Uh, but your typical geologist can't tell you, for example, a whole lot about emeralds because emeralds are rare um, and therefore not something super important in the field of geology. So if you like pretty sparkly minerals, I hear you, but um, we don't actually talk about them all that much in geology. So let's write that on the board. Okay, so what I just wrote up there is that important minerals are those that are geologically common, not those that are rare or of economic value. So the important ones are the common ones, not the sparkly or rare ones. Give you a chance to write that down as I erase the other section. Okay, so this here is a little pie chart showing us the major ingredients in Earth's crust. 
So when we talked about how Earth differentiated, we talked about how the lighter ingredients, the oxygen and the silicon, are the two major ingredients in Earth's crust. And here we can see that in this pie chart. You do not need to know the percents, um, but it's almost 50% oxygen and then almost 30% silicon. So there's a good chunk of the Earth's crust that are silicon and oxygen. And then there are some other ingredients. There's some iron there, some magnesium, some potassium, some sodium, and some calcium, and some aluminum. And it's really these ingredients that are the ingredients that we have to work with when forming our minerals. And again, most importantly, we have this foundation of silicon and oxygen, because again, those are the two most abundant minerals in Earth's crust, and they do like to bond to one another. They tend to well, let's just say they like to bond with one another. Uh, you can take more chemistry for some of the reasons why they like to bond together. Um, but silicon and oxygen tend to form together, forming this little pyramidal structure called a silica tetrahedron. And it's the silica tetrahedron that forms the foundation of almost all of the minerals in Earth's crust, or at least all of the important minerals and Earth's crust are made out of these silica tetrahedron, again, made of silicon and oxygen. And then those other ingredients, the iron, the magnesium, the potassium, and sodium, and calcium, and aluminum, just reading the bottom of the pie chart there, those other ingredients show up, um, but they're kind of based around the framework of the silicon and the oxygen. So. Again, it's those ingredients that make up the Earth's crust, which forms the minerals that we find in the rocks forming Earth's crust. And the two main ingredients that we find in Earth's crust that you should know are silicon and oxygen. Again, those are the two dominant elements. So we want to make sure we have that in our notes. So we'll write something like um, the two major ingredients, the two main elements forming Earth's crust. The two main elements forming Earth's crust. are silicon, and you actually do want to know the abbreviation for silicon. It's something that is such a common element in almost every mineral that we find here on Earth. You should really know the abbreviation, and it's not that hard. Silicon is just SI. It's not like sodium where the NA seems like it's a mystery. It's either Greek or Latin. Most of, most of the, uh, the funkinesses of the periodic table are really like, where did, where, why PB for lead? It's either a Greek word or a Latin word. This is, this is just very standard, SI for silicon. So again, the two main elements forming Earth's crust are silicon and what was the other? Oxygen. That's a Y. Um, and oxygen is just abbreviated with an O. So those are the two main ingredients. They form the foundation of almost every mineral that we come across here on Earth's crust. Now, when silicon and oxygen come into contact with one another, they like to link together. Again, take chemistry for some of these details. Uh, but basically, to fill the outer electron shell, um, you have them linked together in, in a structure called a silica tetrahedron. So actually, there's two parts there. Let me first say, when silicon and oxygen link together, we call that combination silica. I know, it's kind of annoying. There's silica and there's silicon. And they're related, but they're not literally the same thing. So silicon plus oxygen equals silica. And so silicon and oxygen link together, forming silica tetrahedron.
So again, silicon and oxygen link together, forming silica tetrahedron. And again, these are the building blocks for almost all of the minerals in the crust. Silica tetrahedron are the building blocks, that's an S for blocks, um, for almost all of the minerals in the crust. So yeah, you need to know what a silica tetrahedron is. And, and just, again, I, I know I said it in one of my earlier video clips, this is the most technical lecture you're going to have every throughout the entire semester. So if you could just power through this lecture, for those of you that aren't chemistry people, just hang in there, power through, the next topic will be way less technical. Okay, tetrahedron. So tetrahedron, think of a, of a little pyramid. So here's my little styrofoam balls. I have three on the bottom. I have one on top. This, this structure here is a silica tetrahedron. And this is how silicon and oxygen like to link together. So there's just different ways we can draw silica tetrahedron. I'm going to just show you a bunch of different examples of this. So again, two major ingredients, silicon and oxygen. Uh, so that right there is a silica tetrahedron. So we have three oxygens on the bottom of that pyramid. Those were those three balls I was holding up. And then there was one ball on top. That's another oxygen on top. And then the silicon atom is in the middle of that tetrahedron. So if you could have seen inside my little styrofoam little tower I made, um, the silicon would have been hidden inside. So if we just look at the silica tetrahedron and we want to write out the ingredients, again, it's made of silicon and oxygen, but how many of each? How many silicon atoms? Just one. It's so what's in the middle. How many oxygen atoms? Four. So the chemical formula of a silica tetrahedron is SiO4. One silicon, four oxygens. So if you had space under there, I'm just going to write it over here. So again, silica tetrahedron are the building blocks of all of the minerals in the crust. Its chemical formula is SiO4. If you don't see a number there, that just means there's one. So one silicon for every four oxygens. And, and you can write that out if it's not obvious to you. Trying to draw it is not my forte. I know some of you guys are art people. Draw a silica tetrahedron. Um, I can try. Actually, let me pause the video so that if I do a really terrible job, you won't have to watch me do a terrible job. Okay, I did a pretty good job in my opinion. So all I did, if you want to draw it in your notes, Three circles, that's the bottom of the tetrahedron. I just put little, little dots in the middle and then you connect them. So that's the base of the tetrahedron. And then there's the ball on top. And so it's trying to represent the ball on top that's a little bit challenging. If you kind of connect them together, you, could, you can make a little dot a little bit more pronounced. I mean, ideally there'd be a bigger circle for that third ball, or the, the fourth ball that's on top? I don't know. Draw it or don't draw it. Um, on your homework sheet, I'll just put a few pictures of it so that if you want to just use the picture from your homework sheet, that works too for just taking notes. So again, there's one version of a silica tetrahedron. Here are a bunch of additional versions, so you can pick which one you like the best. Um, so this is the one with is most similar probably to my little ball thing, the little styrofoam balls I was holding up, the little blue dot in the middle is the silicon. Um, here's one where you're seeing more kind of like the bonds holding them together. Um, this would be more like what I drew on the board where you're kind of looking down at the silica tetrahedron, kind of from, from the head looking down. And this would be like if I didn't draw the, um, the circles, it would have this pattern. And draw that pattern. That's basically this, but without the circles. So this is a common way I'll draw it on the board because it's the easiest way of drawing it. So if you can imagine that's sort of a pyramid sticking out of the board, 
that is a silica tetrahedron, the building block of all of the, well, most of the minerals on Earth's crust. So again, various versions of the drawing of a silica tetrahedron. What we now need to talk about are the electrical charges of the atoms in a silica tetrahedron. I told you this is the most technical lecture. So I'm just going to tell you that oxygen tends to have a negative two charge. That outer orbital had six electrons. To make it full with eight, we need to add two more, which gives it an overall negative two charge. Again, just, just write that down if, if the whole orbital thing is, is messing with you. So oxygen tends to have a negative two charge, and silicon tends to have a plus four charge. So if it were to want that outer orbital fill, filled, what it often will do is just like get rid of those electrons in the outer orbital, which would then make it more positive than the negative, and it would have a plus four charge. Again, if that went over your head, it doesn't matter. All you need to do is memorize that oxygen has a negative two charge, and silicon has a plus four charge. And once we know that, we can then talk about the overall electrical charge of a silica tetrahedron. Phew. Okay, so somewhere in your notes. Silicon, which, I mean, I, I should just abbreviate as SI, but I'm, I'm still getting you used to it. Um, has a plus four charge. So we write that as SI plus four. And I just put it in parentheses just so you can kind of see it's one package. So each oxygen has a negative two charge. And so we would write that O for oxygen and then a negative two on top. So when we kind of are labeling pictures, you'll see SI plus four because it has a plus four electrical charge. You'll see O negative two because oxygens tend to have a negative two charge. So I'm going to label the silica tetrahedron. Um, I think it's nice to kind of label it in the picture. If, um, if you're a visual person, it, it'll probably help you to do that. Um, another way is just to kind of do the math on the board, and it's not, it's not really math. I mean, there's some math, but it's not. You all can do this math. OK, just needed a little space. So silicon, again, has what charge? Plus 4. And there's just one of them, right? The fact that there's no number written next to that means there's one. Oxygen has a negative two charge. And there's four of them. So one of these, four of those. So you can label the picture. So I was trying to draw an arrow. evil red pen. Okay, so that's a negative two, negative two, negative two, negative two. So each one of the, those corners of the tetrahedron is an oxygen. There's four of them, each have a negative two. And then in the middle of that tetrahedron that you can't really see, there is that silicon. Which has a plus four charge. So whatever works for your brain. You like to label your picture. You like to just make it a list. I don't really care. What I want you to be able to tell me is what the overall electrical balance is of a single silica tetrahedron. If it has four, I'm sorry, one plus four charge and four negative two charges, what's its overall electrical charge? Negative. So that plus four and that negative two and that negative two, they cancel each other out. And then there are two additional negative twos left over, which makes for a negative four. That's your math. Not that bad. Right? Those cancel each other out, and that just leaves a negative four charge left behind. 
So a way that we can represent this by writing the chemical formula of a silica tetrahedron is to write its SiO4 to the negative 4. Did I mention this is the most technical lecture? I know I did, but just reminding you, just get through it. It's not that bad. So just as we wrote with the oxygen, the negative 2 kind of up to the corner, that's all I did here. SiO4, it has a negative 4 up to the corner. That's it. Okay, let's just look at this in some of the pictures. So various silica tetrahedron up there. Let's see. So here's the negative 2 for each corner there of the silica tetrahedron. Silicon itself has a plus 4. So maybe that plus 4 and these minus 2 balance each other out. So that leaves a remaining negative 4 behind. So that overall silica tetrahedron has a negative 4 charge. We could label that picture. Again, each one of those balls is our oxygen. They're negative 2. The silicon in the middle has a plus 4. Again, that plus 4, maybe those negative 2s cancel each other out. You have a negative 4 left over. Label one of the pictures if you want to, if you happen to, to have a printout from the homework sheet and, and you like labeling the pictures and you can't figure out how to draw it yourself. Or you can draw something on the board like I did. I kind of like the list way of doing it, but, you know, whatever works best for you. As long as you know the electrical charge of a silicon, the electrical charge of an oxygen, and how that would create a negative four charge of a silica tetrahedron. So, again, I just added this negative four up here. Okay, so is a silica tetrahedron a cation or an anion? What was the difference between a cation and an anion? Cations are what? Positively charged ions, because we like cats, or we notice that there's that plus sign in the middle, that's the T. Uh, the anion, I'm anti this, I'm anti that, I am negative. So again, silica tetrahedron, is it a cation or an anion? It's an anion. It's a negatively charged ion. So is a silica tetrahedron in itself a mineral? Remember that minerals are neutrally charged. We, we link things together so that those cations and anions balance out. Is this balanced? No, it's, it's negative. So it's not a mineral yet. It's the building block of a mineral. And I'm not going to write that on the board, but you might want to write that in your notes. I mean, we've already kind of said it. It's the building block of minerals. But because it's not neutrally charged, it's not a mineral itself. Its goal is to become a neutrally charged mineral. Okay. Rewind if you need to. So it is an anion. And if we want it to make it happy, since it's overall negatively charged, what do anions need to become neutrally charged? It needs some cations. It needs some positively charged ions to balance it out. Specifically, how much positive charge does it need? Plus four. So it is negative four. If it can find, hello, four pluses, did that on its own, it's magical, um, those four plus charges would balance things out and create something neutral. Then it would be a mineral. And we can do this in different ways. We could have four plus one charges. We could have a plus one and a plus three. That equals four. We could have two plus twos. That also would equal four. So there are different ratios that we can have, but the fundamental principle is you need plus four to balance out a silica tetrahedron. You need some cations with an electrical charge of plus four to balance things out. You got this. Okay, so let's look at what cations are actually available. So if you look at the crust, down here at the bottom, we had various plus charged things. These are the cations. We have iron and magnesium and potassium and sodium and calcium and aluminum. So all of the other major ingredients in Earth's crust are cations. And so we have those cations that link together 
with the silica tetrahedron in order to create a neutrally charged mineral. Okay, so again, those are the cations right there. I've also put this pie chart in your homework sheet in case you didn't notice that. So if you wanted to take notes on this pie chart, it would also be available to you. So not all cation works equally well. So some cations will be more likely to form minerals than other cations. So let me just show you some examples here. Um, let me get rid of my face. You don't need my face anyways. Okay, so if you look, for example, at aluminum, aluminum has a plus three charge, which seems pretty cool. You're almost there to getting the plus four that you want, but it's, it's not quite enough. Now, there's potassium and there's sodium. They have a plus one charge. So if we have one aluminum and one potassium, or one aluminum and one sodium, that would give us the plus four charge that we would need. And, and here they are on the periodic table. So here is my silicon, here's my oxygen, here's my aluminum plus three, here's my sodium, here's my potassium. And the size of the circles are communicating the size of each one of those elements. Now, the trick, or the challenge, I guess I should say, about all this is what's written up there in black. So the atomic radii, so the width, the size of those atoms, um, of aluminum, potassium, and sodium, are too large, or you can think of them as, as uneven, to fit in most crystal structures. So if your silica tetrahedron is made of these relatively small atoms, to then put a gigantic sodium or a gigantic potassium in there, they just don't fit. So it might balance things out, but they're the wrong size. So it can happen, it's just not super common. So really, Aluminum, potassium, and sodium, I mean, technically speaking, they would work to create something neutral. It just doesn't happen very often because their sizes are just too big. They, they just don't fit in that silica tetrahedron. They don't, they don't fit in the box very well. So if aluminum, sodium, and potassium, and, and A is sodium, and, and K is potassium, um, if they aren't really options, well, let's look at what other options we have. So now we have iron, magnesium, and calcium, they all have plus two charges. Okay, well that's cool. If we have two of those, maybe two irons, or two magnesiums, or two calciums, or maybe one iron and one calcium, or one magnesium and one calcium, or one iron and one magnesium, there's all these different combinations. But if we have two of them, two plus twos make plus four, which would balance out the negative four silica tetrahedron. So that, that's another great way of balancing things out. So again, let's look at our periodic table. Again, we have our silicon and our oxygen there boxed in red. That's where aluminum and sodium and potassium were. If you look at now magnesium and calcium and iron, notice that they're a little bit smaller than the other ones, although calcium is still pretty big. So. Again, how well do you think calcium will fit? If sodium didn't fit, and sodium is actually smaller than calcium, do you think calcium will be a really great option? No, I mean, calcium really has the same problem. It's just, it's just too big of an atom. It doesn't fit well in crystal structures. So this was a very long-winded way of getting to the punchline, which is that iron and magnesium are the most common elements that combine with the silica tetrahedron. Okay, again, silica tetrahedron is a negative four, so we need a plus four amount of cations to balance things out. needs plus four in cations to balance things out. The two cations most commonly used are iron, which is abbreviated Fe, and that's one of the other ones you should really know. I'm just going to put a plus two there so that you know okay, that's what its electrical charge is. And 
and magnesium, which is abbreviated as Mg, but with a plus two sign. So almost all minerals on Earth, at least in the crust, are made of silica tetrahedron together with iron and magnesium. If you look at a mineral that's kind of greenish in color, that's the iron that's in it. Um, so especially dark colored minerals tend to have a lot of iron and magnesium in them. And there's all this fun chemistry stuff related to this, which is actually, once you get it, it's actually very cool stuff. Next class, we will talk more about silica tetrahedron. So a little bit more technical stuff, and then we'll be done with all of the technical stuff, the, the really deep technical stuff for the entire semester. Um, but it is important stuff, especially if you're going to be a geology major. But even if you're not, um, this idea of how it's working will actually explain a bunch of different things in the future as well. So it is really good, get rid of my head, it is really good to spend the time you need to learn about silica tetrahedron, even if you're like, I'm not a chemist. It's good for you. Builds character. We'll talk more next time.